morning and welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Public Works. Today is Friday, January 5th, 2018. Commissioner Repenning, Commissioner Davis, Commissioner Jacinto are present. Vice President Repenning, we do have a quorum. But we start with Bureau introductions, please, starting with Bureau of Engineering. Good morning, Reza Shahmirzadi, Bureau of Engineering. Good morning, Sefi Wiles, Bureau of Contract Administration. Good morning, Tim Tyson, Bureau of Street Services. Good morning, Chris Enriquez, Bureau of Street Lighting. Good morning, Shuram Karagani, LA Sanitation. Good morning, Ted Jordan, Public Works General Counsel. Good morning, Fernando Campos, Executive Officer, Vice President Repenning. We did receive a speaker card under general public comment. We also received speaker cards on items number two and six for today's agenda. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close um, uh, neighborhood council commentary. And I'm also going to um, go ahead and make a motion that we approve uh, the minutes from the meeting of Friday, December 1st, 2017. Seconded by Commissioner Davis. Those minutes are approved and uh, adopted for the record. Um, we'll go ahead and hear our public, uh, general public commentary, Dr. Tom Williams from the Sierra Club. Good morning, Dr. Tom Williams, Sierra Club Transportation Committee, Water Committee, and Citizens Coalition for a Safe Community. Public comment. Curb cuts. In 1972, we got the Berkeley Public Works Department director to try to go across a one inch lip on a curb cut. It was the beginning of the Center for Independent Living, which then morphed into ADA. 50 years, almost. And we still can't get curb cuts done right. I am going to submit a PRA on Monday regarding all curb cuts done in 2017 and to be done in 2018 as to their adequacy. We got curb cuts approved for mission. Thank you very much. It's the USC Medical Center and you have two intersections which have no curb cuts. Next to the medical center problem. In 90032, we have problems in that on one side we get a curb cut, on the other side it's a tree, a utility box, and an uncut curb. At least six different locations. Did they run out of money and didn't want to get a change order? I don't know. Was the design an error? I don't know. But we can't get access to Bhavan to check as to drawings and things like that. So the PRA will also ask as to how does the public access Bhavan? Because I used to have access, but not anymore. And I've tried the links and nobody is linked. So we have a- Two problem. minutes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close uh, general public comment. Um, one housekeeping item, agenda item number two in CD4, tree removal permit extension 3802 Holly Line Avenue. We've had a request to continue that item uh, to next week. That'll be uh, Friday, January 12th, 2018. Does that work for you, Dr. Campos? Yes, it does. Thank you, Vice President. Okay, so that agenda item will be continued. Um, let's go to agenda item number one. Uh, this is in CD14. It's a task order solicitation number 36. Tetra IBI Group Architecture and Planning, Tetra IBI, recommending the board authorize the city engineer to issue the task to Tetra IBI from the pre-qualified on-call architectural consultants list to provide architectural and engineering design services and construction administration services for the automated traffic surveillance and control group relocation as stated in task order solicitation number 36 with a budget authority of $650,000 which includes contingency. Uh, on this item, Ohaji. Hi, Mr. Ohaji Abdallah. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners and executives. Uh, Ohaji Abdullah with the Bureau of Engineering Architectural Division. As stated, we are here to have the task order solicitation approved for Tetra IBI for the relocation of the ADSAC group.
from P4 of City Hall to the Caltrans building, 11th floor. It's roughly going to encompass an 11,000 square feet uh, on the Caltrans building and will include staff offices and the control room. This approach is a split approach, whereas we are leaving the, the servers and brains of the ATSAC system within P4 of City Hall East and moving the control room and staff to the Caltrans building, which makes their, uh, their workflow more efficient um, and, and will ensure that they are up and running before the next Olympics uh, in, in order to handle that, that mass influx of, of traffic and sound. Commissioner Asinto. Thank you, Vice President Rupenning. Ohaji, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I don't have a problem with the scope of work. It's, in, you know, in terms of ATSAC controls and how we're splitting it. I'm interested in why only one submittal, one proposal on the, on the TOS solicitation did we get back? Yes, yes. So it, the, uh, this is a, a very, uh, obviously, a transportation-oriented design as well as some, some small uh, a tenant improvement architectural component. Um, the, for the outreach, we received three consultants who attended the job walks. Um, once they realized the true scope of the project, um, they realized that that uh, Dory Tetra was the was probably going to get the job, and so they pulled off from from the jobs. The two other competing firms pulled off prior to the submittal of the proposals because of the scope of the the targeted but specific scope of what you did because say. of the the heavy transportation scope um, within it. Tetra IBI has a transportation engineering uh, firm within their architectural firm. The other firms would have had to reach out. And, and solicit an, a transportation engineering firm. Um, and they felt that they would not be as competitive as Tetra IBI. Um, I encourage them to continue to, to, to still submit um, as we want competition in, in all of our task order solicitations, uh, but they did not, they, they pulled off. Okay, so thank you for that explanation. I appreciate yes. that, that, that explains it. And, but, and it seems that they did well in their, in their BIP business inclusion outreach, 22% over pledge of 18 and five, almost 6% for four, so uh, that's good for them too as well. So thank you. Thank you. I just have a question about um, engineering's involvement in this. We're, essentially it's a, it's a design for the Caltrans building, correct? Yes. So Caltrans is a, is a state-owned building, yes. but we, the city, are designing it because it's going to house the city A city function. entity, absolutely. And we're working very closely with the state, and they've been great partners thus far and providing as-built drawings, uh, coordinating the work, um, and our, our general services department, real estate division, is currently negotiating the, the lease agreements uh, with them, and they've, they've been very amenable to, to the process. So they're coming out of the basement and on <laughs> the floor. I'm sure they'll appreciate the sunlight. They will appreciate some sunlight. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to close off some of the windows in the control room area, um, as that doesn't benefit the, the control room, and the, the, the displays. Thank you for your work on this. Thank you. Mo uh, moved by Commissioner Sinto, seconded by Commissioner Davis. That'll be adopted. Um, any objections to sending it forthwith? Okay, we'll send that forthwith. Um, agenda item number three. This is with the Office of Community Beautification. Uh, contract amendment for graffiti control systems recommending the board, number one, authorize the Office of Community Beautification to execute a contract amendment with graffiti control systems to increase the ceiling amount of the contract by an amount of $40,000, and two, authorize the Department of General Services to piggyback on an existing contract that the Office of Community Beautification administers, administers with graffiti control systems. Um, Mr. Paul Raj. Good morning, Paul Raj, Director of the Office of Community Beautification. Um, and we have received a request from the Department of General Services to piggyback on an existing contract that OCB currently has with Graffiti Control Systems. General Services uh, would like to utilize the services of GCS for graffiti abatement on city facilities, pressure cleaning of sidewalks around city facilities, and other various as-needed work items. Graffiti Control Systems is a privately owned company located in North Hollywood. They've been a longtime contractor of the Office of Community Beautification, providing specialty graffiti abatement, high elevation graffiti removal, graffiti removal for murals, and the application of protective coatings onto murals.
approval of this board item would allow OCB to increase the ceiling amount of the contract uh, so that general services would be able to provide uh, payment to graffiti control systems. The actual funding does come from general services. No public works uh, dollars would actually be used in this, uh, this work, and uh, we do request board approval. Thank you. So, Paul, is this for... Um so we're, we're lifting the ceiling by $40,000 in order for uh, general services to be able to come in, use our contract, and hire this firm that does specialty graffiti removal, protective coatings, areas that are hard for our normal contractors to clean. Is it primarily going to be used for city, city facilities? Yes. So, so general services, so like, you know, when uh, City Hall occasionally gets tagged or something like that, and they don't have the actual capability to remove it with their own employees. They'll uh, utilize graffiti control systems to come in and do that work, and then through the OCB contract have authority to make payment to them. They also sometimes utilize them for like just uh, uh, steam cleaning of sidewalks or other things like that, whether it's around City Hall or other city facilities. Okay, um, and is, is the amount that they are going to be spending uh, this year, forty thousand, or is is it more than that? Well, it w it won't be more than that. It could possibly be less than that. I mean, they they ask for authority uh, in our contract up to forty thousand dollars. You know, obviously graffiti. You don't always know, you know, how often facilities will get hit or what they may be able to utilize regular general services crews for. But but that would be the maximum amount um, that they'd be able to to piggyback on the contract. Got it. Okay, thank you, Paul. Any questions? I'll go ahead, go ahead and make a motion to approve agenda item number three, seconded by Commissioner Davis. Uh, any objections to sending it forthwith? Adopted and sent forthwith. Thank you very much, thank Paul. Thank you. Agenda item number four. <coughs> this is a joint report, um, Bureau of Engineering and Bureau of Sanitation. CD 11, change order number five, Vatane Trenchless Services Incorporated. Recommending the board, number one, authorize the city engineer to issue a change order to Vadnay Trenchless Services Incorporated for a not to exceed amount of $1,143,614.22 for the Venice Dual Force Main and Venice Pumping Plant Generator Replacement Project to redesign and construct shaft number six. Um, Givork Makertekian. How did I do on your last uh, name? Makertekian. Oh. Givork Makertekian. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Commissioners and Bureau of Representative. Um, so the Venice Two Enforcement Project, it's about an uh, $88.9 million project uh, going on for three years. We're one year into it right now, and we're installing about two miles of uh, force main sewer pipe, so it's pressurized sewer pipe via tunneling through Venice and the Playa del Rey communities. Um, we have 11 shafts throughout the two miles. Uh, we dig down, we dig the shafts down between 40 to 70 feet and then we tunnel in between the shafts. One of the shafts, shaft six, uh, it has to be a certain size, of course, and when we did preliminary puddling, we found there was a very large Edison duct bank that carries, um, uh, I think, 124,000 volt power lines. That was uh, larger than was shown on the plants. So that, that triggered a significant redesign of the shaft the negotiated price is $1.143 million. Commissioner Sinkin. Thank you. Um, Gavork, I remember we visited that one site. Yes. And due to the differing site conditions or the as-builts, right, we assumed that the, the duct bank, whatever the as-builts underneath weren't as large as they were, so the design was necessitated by this sort of uh, unforeseen condition. Yeah, what happened was Southern California Edison gave us the information about the location of their duct bank. Uh, they gave us center line, which is dimensionless, but the dimension of the actual duct bank is about eight feet uh, wide. So uh, it ended up encroaching into our shaft space because the dimensions were not considered in their information. Okay, so in, as they're as built to our design, so we would have had to redo it anyway because of the of it there, whether it's a change order or whether we we did it originally. Yes, so if this was, if we had this information previously during design, the shaft would have been designed the way it is now and the cost of that shaft would have been higher uh, as well. As a circular? 
uh, as a square shaft, it's more expensive, which is what we're doing now. Previously designed was a circular shaft, which is significantly less expensive. Okay. All right, I understand. And um, there's no way to avoid that, right, with, with um, a private mm, utility company giving us more accurate information. Well, when they give us the information, we, I guess we assume it's accurate, and then before we install the shaft, we do the puddling to confirm. So, and that only happens during construction. Okay, so we found that out when we were puddling. And yeah. So we go back to, we report back to them, say, hey, your asbills were wrong? Uh, we definitely asked, uh, asked them if they gave us any other information and, and why they didn't give us the dimensions, and they said, well, we generally don't give you that dimension. So. Okay, well, let's do that the next time. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, so I, I had a couple questions as well. Um, I mean, it, it is a, a significant amount of money um, to do the redesign based on, it's, it sounds like it was an unavoidable communication. There was no way to verify, that was there, would there have been a way to verify that the information given to us was accurate before we were actually under construction? I, I suppose it's possible during the design phase if, if, if they were to question the information they're getting from the utility companies. So I would echo Commissioner Jacinto's comments and say that, you know, I, I do hope that we've learned a lesson from this and that we're, we're going to verify in future projects that, you know, when we see something on a map provided by a utility as far as the actual location of the pipe that we understand of. Yes, absolutely. We, uh, for this situation and most situations uh, similar to this, we write um, a lessons learned and we share it with the designers uh -huh. and we discuss it. You know, on the other hand, I am looking at, I mean, the total budget for the project is $88.8 .8 million with a contingency of $4.4 million. It's a big project. Yeah. And it looks like thus far um, we haven't had, a, you know, the, cha the change orders have been fairly minimal. Yes. Um, so this is the first big one, and yes. hopefully the last. I hope so, too. Okay. <laughs> I hope so, too. Commissioner Davis? Yeah, I just want to say, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but yet at the same time, moving forward, obviously, this is not the only project that we'll have moving forward like this. So I would hope, administratively, we can have some protocols in place in terms of when we deal with external, um, uh, external stakeholders in a project, that there is some protocol that we have that we trust but verify the information we're receiving on maps across the board as a general policy. Uh, given this issue, uh, I want to make sure that in the future when we receive these things from the map that we're able to verify uh, through some discussion with the people from whom we receive the map that these things are currently accurate. I don't know how we do that, but I think there's some procedures and some processes that we can put in place, not just for this project, but for all projects moving forward, and I think that procedure will at least help us to increase uh, the unlikelihood that there will be inaccurate uh, assessments given to us. So I'd like to see a system in place for that. Absolutely okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there a motion on agenda item number four? Moved by Commissioner Sinto, seconded by Commissioner Davis. Any objection to sending it forthwith? Hearing none, the item will be adopted and sent forthwith. Moving on to agenda item number five, this is with the Department of Transportation and our Bureau of Contract Administration and CD14. It's a change order, Los Angeles Adaptive Traffic Control System at, at CUS, not at SAC, it's at CUS. Phase two, recommending the board, number one, approve the amended construction funding for the LA LA8 CS phase two and increase the contingency by $591,531 plus 15% contingency as discussed in this report and to authorize the general manager for the Department of Transportation to issue a supplemental non-participating change order bid item number 13, serial number one, to the contract with Sturgeon Electric California LLC for $591,531 plus 15% contingency to implement the protected bike lane Spring Street project 
which includes improvements to seven existing signalized intersections, including the installation of bike signals at four of these seven intersections and improvements at four mid-block crosswalks. Um, do I have a sticker card on this one? Oh, number six, okay. Uh, I have from, I have Mehdi Dirkshani on agenda item number five. Good morning. And Ms. Vice President, uh, Fernando Campos, Executive Officer, just to intervene before the um, testimony presented by the Department of Transportation. On recommendation number one, the agenda does state to increase the contingency by 591,531. That is a typographical error. It should be $539,531. Again, instead of 591, it should be 539. So that recommendation number one and recommendation number two are aligned. The report that's before you is accurate. It's just the uh, typographical on the agenda. Okay, so the correct amount is 531? 539. 531. 539. 539. 539. The number in uh, number, the, nu the second recommendation is the accurate number. Correct. It is incorrect. So okay. we're going to match number that one and two. That makes sense. They should match. Thank you, Fernando. Hi. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, Mehdi Derekshani from the Department of Transportation, uh, here to ask for your approval to authorize the General Manager of the Department of Transportation to issue a non-participating change order for Los Angeles Adaptive Traffic Control System Phase 2 project for $539,531 to implement the Protected Bike Lane Spring Street project. The city has prioritized the implementation of a complete street, multimodal approach to transportation design to make our streets safer for all users, including pedestrians, bicyclists, public transit users, as well as automobiles. With this goal in mind and in partnership with Council Member Jose Huizar, Downtown LA Forward Initiative, a motion presented to the City Council in October of 2017 instructed the Department of Transportation to configure the streets, to reconfigure the streets in downtown Los Angeles and analyze a multimodal transportation option in downtown. Protected bike lane Spring Street is the first part of that complete street project, which will reconfigure Spring Street from 1st Street to 8th Street. The project will better organize Spring Street to improve intersections and crossings for people walking and upgrade the existing buffered bicycle lane to a protected bicycle lane. And will reduce bus bicycle conflicts. The improvements include traffic signal upgrades at seven existing inter intersections, including the installation of bike signals at four of these intersections, similar to Los Angeles Street. A leading pedestrian inter interval known as LPI, signalization strategy will be impl implemented that will give pedestrians an exclusive two to three seconds to begin crossing the streets before the pedestrians, before uh, the cars get the green light, which will improve visibility and make the crossing safer for pedestrians. The existing buffered bicycle lane will also be relocated from the right, the right side of the street to the, late, to the left side of the streets. This will improve safety for bicyclists and reduce bus bicycle conflicts. Uh, reconfiguration of the streets will also maximize parking and loading and increase bus efficiency. Uh, the project was developed based on analysis done by Department of Transportation and in, members and in, and in partnership with uh, District 14 Council Member Jose Huizar. The funding for this project comes from Measure R, Local Fund Number 51Q Bicycle Plan. We would appreciate your support in approving the funding for this project. The city has prioritized these upgrades as part of the Vision Zero initiative. Uh, the implementation of this project will promote a safe and orderly movement of pedestrians, bicycle, and vehicular traffic in downtown Los Angeles. So the reason um, for this ch this change order is essentially that you all are trying to expedite the project. And so you're running it through an existing contract rather than wanting to go back out to bid. Is that correct? Correct. correct. Okay. The implementation has been prioritized as part of Vision Zero and doing so as a non-participating change order will 
expedite the, uh, the implementation of this project. So you're basically adding to an existing contract. Correct. So it's not like you're something went wrong and you need more money. This is the full funding for the project. It's just being called a change order in order to be able to piggyback. Correct. Okay. It Correct. sounds like a worthwhile cause to me. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Um, I will make a motion on agenda item number five, seconded by Commissioner Sinto. Any objection to sending it forthwith? The item will be adopted and sent forthwith. Thank you, Mr. Dirkshani. Thank you. Agenda item number six is an oral report. Um, before we get started, I do have a uh, speaker card on number six from Dr. Tom Williams from the Sierra Club. Sure. Uh, We'll go ahead and hear from Richard Clark and Gary Baker on the transportation project status update, Metropolitan Transportation Authority and Department of Transportation, A, Regional Connector Transportation Projects Update, B, Oral Report Back from the Metropolitan Transit Authority on Public Outreach and Community Complaints Received, if any, related to the street closure appro approved at the Board of Public Works on October 25th, 2017. Good morning. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, actually, uh, we brought all our project managers here today per, per our standard process. Uh, you'll hear last from Jim Cohen, project manager for Purple Line Section 1, uh, who will address some of the feedback that you've received from stakeholders. Um, so just overall, I'll be very brief and say our projects are going well. We're working very well with the City of Los Angeles. Uh, you have some great people in your departments, and uh, we're also very heavily engaged in new Measure M projects, which are still largely in the planning stage, but they'll proceed pretty quickly to construction. You'll be hearing about them. So uh, I'm going to turn it over first to Gary Baker from the Regional Connector. Uh, I have a flash drive for a presentation, but I know you have hard copies. Just, just do the hard copies? Okay. Good morning, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioners. Glad to uh, report all the progress we've had on uh, Regional Connector since, uh, I think, uh, speaking to you last quarter. Um, just briefly turning to uh, page two of uh, Regional Connector slide. Talk about uh, completion of our tunnel work, uh, actually scheduled for next week. And this marks a huge milestone for the project and um, just um, very excited that we've uh, come through this uh, pretty well, um, made up a lot of time that we uh, suffered some losses with some um, Encountering some abandoned structures, you know, during our first tunnel drive, I think we talked about that, but uh, we've made up that time and are now turning our focus towards uh, a lot of structural work in the stations. Uh, there'll be a retirement ceremony for Angeli, our tunnel machine, and celebration of 50% uh, complete uh, milestone on the, on the project uh, later uh, this quarter. And so uh, we're all excited to uh, mark the progress of, of the project in that way. Uh, turning over to Broadway Street Station, you see the two photos there, one on the left uh, just three months ago uh, versus the one on the right. You see the large county storm drain there um, supported and working on underpinning uh, work. Uh, more importantly, we held a <coughs> workshop with Bureau of Engineering staff about the upcoming uh, mining uh, for the sequential, for the crossover tavern uh, using the sequential excavation method. This was an area of concern. Uh, they came and attended a workshop, and they have since approved the design that we have for that. So uh, we've been working well with the Bureau of Engineering and want to thank them for their uh, support of our project on many angles. Uh, we're also continuing to work with the two developers uh, nearby and coordinating our uh, respective uh, projects. Turning then to Grand Avenue Arts and Bunker Hill Station, uh, just a lot of concreting work. These are large stations. This is the deep excavation that you may uh, recall pretty much doing weekly concrete pours. Uh, things are going as scheduled there, so uh, nothing real exciting, I guess, <laughs> on that, but uh, we're just pleased with the progress. And then finally, looking at Flower Street, <coughs> which has been the center of a lot of um, uh, presentations to you, 
Edward. Uh, just pleased to report that we picked up the uh, street closure at 6th uh, as committed to you uh, right before Thanksgiving. That was a tremendous success and help for the project and we thank you for that. Uh, we still have some work to do south of 6th and we'll be coming uh, to you uh, probably uh, April, May of this uh, year to uh, request weekend closures for that uh, to complete the remaining decking. And then there's another request that'll be before you, uh, if not next week, the following week uh, for removal of the TBM equipment at 4th Street. This is weekend closures, uh, similar to what we did the first uh, sequence. Uh, so we'll be uh, seeing you uh, sh within the next uh, 10 days, I suspect, on that one. But uh, overall, work on Flower Street is um, normalized and is, um, is going very well. And that closure on 6th is, is no longer? That's correct, yes. We uh, picked it up on um, right, right before Thanksgiving. Great. So. <coughs> and just, uh, you asked us to report kind of on our business interruption fund. Uh, because we're under steady state at both of the sites, uh, there's been no new applications since reporting to you last. Uh, the, um, the fund still remains active at Little Tokyo, but um, we don't expect any further applications until we have uh, uh, l later in the project when we have uh, more street impacts. So we're under steady state now. So I think the, the fund has been very successful, a total of $2.6 million uh, given to small mom and pop shops uh, to support their business during the construction. So. And you can see uh, the following slide, we continue to assess the uh, success of the pilot program and report to our board of directors. And then uh, even outside the program, we're, uh, we, we remain active with the small businesses and encouraging them to uh, and support them in terms of advertising um, in our quarterly newsletters on our source uh, feature and then uh, through other media sources, social media sources, uh, and also assist them through our business assistance group and uh, ways to uh, that have been very helpful so I think that's been a very successful program and then closing uh, the presentation for this project with the community relations outreach uh, this <coughs> past quarter we had over 40 stakeholder briefings and this focused a lot on the, the retrieval of our TBM machine or anticipation of that our flower street decking the weekend closures that we had made very active with the community there. We had five public meetings, direct mailings to 46,000 stakeholders. Uh, obviously, the um, online media is very active as well. So I think uh, the community is um, kept informed and uh, we continue to listen to feedback and, and mitigate impacts to them to the best extent we can. So that concludes my presentation. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to, um, to answer them. Thank you, uh, Vice President Repenning. Gary, good to see you. Thank you for that, and Rick for the opening. Um, great report, you know, in terms of closing up the Sixth Street, delivering the, the street back uh, as promised before Thanksgiving. Um, I'm happy to hear from our Bureau of Engineering staff the two resolutions on the, on the maintenance hole issue uh, and the SEM, the sequential excavation method, and that's sort of the interdependency and the and the cooperation and the collaboration that um, will help uh, all the projects move forward. So I appreciate um, Metro staff working together with our dedicated Bureau of Engineering staff. Um, just a comment, you know, we had the mayor come into our Measure M meeting and the whole city family was present and the mayor really provided his leadership in, in, in requesting and um, encouraging the partnership and the support of all our different departments throughout the city uh, to work together with Metro on that. So I think that that's a, it's a great sign. It's a great leadership from our mayor. And, and you'll continue to have that ongoing partnership. What we want to try to achieve is that maximal kind of um, cooperation where we're working uh, in time, that we're not reactive or proactive and, and really managing the project so that we can, everything goes. We have 28 by 28, and so we have our work to cut out. But uh, you have uh, the partnership of our entire city family your service. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Sinto. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Moving on to the Crenshaw LAX Transit Project. Good morning. Uh, Matt Gallagher, Director of Construction on the Crenshaw Project. We've been kind of hit by the flu bug, so Charles is oh not here today. 
quite a few of us. Our first slide, of course, is our uh, expl explanatory slide. We're at about 75% completion right now. If you go to the next slide, this is a representative of our traffic closure map uh, through February. This is periodically shared with the city agencies and uh, the folks in the field. Starting kind of at the uh, north end of the project, we have our three underground stations. It's all about structural concrete, uh, Lamert Park, uh, cross passages in the tunnels. Uh, the UG4 is referring to the uh, south portal uh, just south of Lamert Park. All those are under heavy construction of, of uh, structural concrete at this time. As you come up out of grade at 48th and go into segment B, we're largely in the center of the street working on our own right of way. Uh, we ha are continue to do some of the street or sidewalk and improvements on the side, although we're kind of getting over the hump on that. Um, coming up probably in April, we'll have a closure uh, to get across the street at Slauson for our first crossing on Crenshaw. We've completed a lot of the crossings at the south end of the project. Now we'll be moving up into the north end of the project on that. And finally, at the south end of the project, we uh, the big thing there, besides all the work we're doing at our, our stations, we're putting up the canopies. The stations are starting to look like stations. Um, people can start to see exactly where the train's going to stop and that and kind of get a feel for what the uh, project actually is going to look like. Um, very uh, near the end of this month, on the 26th, we have a six-week closure so that we can do the civil work connecting our line to the uh, existing operational green line. So that's, that's a big uh, milestone for the project right there, and it should go very smoothly. We've been working with our operations folks for months now, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, with that, that concludes my update. Is, Any questions? What is the, the timeline for actually opening um, this line? October 2019. 2019? Correct. The whole thing? Yes. Including the airport? Uh, our line will open... Uh, it, it's just the north and south. The airport connector is a separate project, if that's what you're referring to. Uh, okay. So, no, in October 2019, I don't believe uh, patrons will actually be able to go from our line into the you know central core of the airport through the people over there. But it'll open and, and bring people through through this, uh, through the Crenshaw corridor. It will connect the green line all the way up to the uh, expo line, correct. Okay. Commissioner Davis? Yeah, I want to. I have an observation and then a question. Uh, in terms of having traveled the area where we're doing construction, I've had the opportunity to do that uh, even on the north end, and I certainly appreciate, I know uh, many, many months ago, we talked about the importance of giving notification to the drivers about the fact that there is uh, construction going on at least several blocks where they'll have an alternative to turn left or right and, and get out of it, and I think that that has worked extremely well. Uh, and I've been able to see that and how effective it has been uh, throughout the particular Crenshaw uh, transit project. Uh, my question is, I noticed that uh, Mr. Baker in his last presentation said that there had not been additional uh, requests from businesses with regard to the fund, uh, the um, fund for businesses, you know, because of construction. Is that true of Crenshaw as well? I don't have an update on the business interruption fund right now. I can certainly get that and uh, have it sent over. Um, it has kind of peaked the, the applications for that. I know that we're about at $5 million on ours. Uh, we've been going a lot more, and we have uh, more small businesses along our alignment. Um, I know it's been successful, but I don't, I don't have an update at this time on the exact What I did work. not know is on the northern end up near Slauson and Crenshaw, uh, on that corner where you have the Shell Station and on numerous small businesses, right. still seems to be uh, some traffic and of course I'm driving and can't really see. There, there, is, there is impact in those areas about, well, once again, as far as their application to the business interruption fund, I'm not sure, but I know we have, we have small partial takes right there, like two and a half feet, sure. where we're adjusting the sidewalk, um, adding left-hand turn lanes and that sort of thing. Sloss and intersection will look a lot different when we're done than it did you know, prior to the project starting. Um, okay, let's move on to the West Side Purple Line extension. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mike McKenna. I'm Metro 
Edwards, Executive Officer and Project Director for Sections 2 and 3 of the Purple Line Extension. So Section 2 is the middle two and a half miles of the nine mile Purple Line Extension. Our contract began about eight months ago. We're about 40% complete on design. Uh, to date, all of the construction activities associated with Section 2 have been related to third party utility relocations in Century City and in Beverly Hills, of course. Uh, the Section 2 alignment is about 85% in the city of Beverly Hills, but the majority of construction will occur in the Century City area, the city of Los Angeles, because that's where tunneling will start. So on the next page, I can give you an update of where we are with our third party utility relocations. We've had uh, tremendous collaboration and support from the city of Los Angeles to allow us to get, us to, to get to where we are right now with our utility relocations. We've completed our joint trench telecom work. We've completed the gas company work. We're more than a third of the way through LADWP power work. We've completed a major portion of the water relocation that's in an area of the street that we give to the contractor early. So the cooperation from the Bureau of Contract Administration, Bureau of Engineering, and the oversight from the Bureau of Contract Administration has been tremendous in helping us get to this point. We're looking to accelerate the remaining third-party utility relocation work with the Department of Water and Power. The Water and Power has their own resources working for us, and so far, um, no major unforeseen conditions, and the rate of the, the work is progressing faster than we planned. So uh, we still have to work with AT&T, who just started recently. Uh, the majority of the utility relocation work that the third parties have from this point forward is in the power and um, telecom work with AT&T, and there's a lot of cable pulling and splicing work that will happen starting later in this year going out into 2019. It's just a, a lot of labor-intensive work just pulling those cables and splicing. But so far, everything is going really well with the utility work. Uh, the first activity for our design builder, Tudor Perini ONG, will uh, commence later this month. We turn over the eastern end of the station box, 200 feet of the street, to the, to the design builder in this month. And that's to uh, construct what we call the launch box, which is the, the first bit of the station box excavation where the tunnel boring machines will be lo lowered in place in the street at, in Constellation Boulevard near the intersection with Century Park East. So in the next few months, our staff will continue working with city staff to support them to come back to you for a request for a street closure that we've been working with um, DOT, BOE, um, and other city staff to prepare for the launching of the tunnel boring machines. So that you'll see me in the near future for that. We'll also have uh, a visit here to um, support city staff for our tree removal permit uh, in early 2018. So it's just, you know, new year, construction really started, getting started on, on section two. So you'll be seeing uh, a lot more of me and my staff at these meetings. So the next slide shows our overall project schedule for section two. So you can see we, we recently completed a court ordered supplemental EIS and uh, heavy construction is scheduled to start next month or two. We'll have pile construction for that launch box area that I spoke of starting in the March-April time frame. And uh, our revenue service completion, uh, the 2026 date is the date that we have in our contract with the federal government in our full funding grant agreement. Our, our forecasted revenue service date right now for Section 2 is August of 2025. So don't have any questions about section two, I can roll right into section three or we could say I could answer section two and three questions at the same time. Um, why don't you go ahead and go on to section three. Thank okay. you. So section three is the final 2.6 miles of the Purple Line extension with two new stations in Westwood or the Westwood area. There's a UCLA station and the Veterans Affairs Hospital in um, just west of the 405 freeway. So we are currently in um, a double procurement blackout period for that. We have two design build contracts for section three, one for uh, the tunnels and one for the stations and systems and track work. So we started both of those, actually on the next slide, you can see sort of a summary of where we are with the procurements. Uh, we started those procurements in 2017. Uh, the tunnel contract is probably the closest to, uh, is the closest to being awarded. We're on track to uh, award that contract quarter in 2018. 
we are looking to award the station's contract in uh, the second quarter of 2019. That's a longer procurement uh, and it started after the tunnel contract. The, the, the contracting method that we have on Section 3 was really born out of the city's push for the 2024 Olympics. And so the contracts were structured to accelerate Section 3. So we're still targeting an accelerated completion for Section 3. Originally, the, the plan in our, our long-term plan was a 2035 project. Our current revenue service date for Section 3 is uh, mid-2026, two years before the 2028 Olympics. And um, so far, no problems with our procurement. We're working with the federal government on our, our funding application. We're anticipating within the month a letter from the FTA allowing us to enter the engineering phase of the New Starts program, which is the first step we take towards a full funding grant agreement within the capital grants investment program. Um, and we're on the verge of starting our utility work out at UCLA Station. Earlier this week, we issued notice to proceed to our contractor for the advanced utility relocation contract. That's DWP Water and Power Work. And uh, we expect that the community will see active construction out there in the late March, early April time frame at the UCLA station. So with that, if you have any questions about either contract, I'd be more than happy to answer. How are we doing on uh, the street closures for the Purple Line? The street closures, for, well, I can speak to Section 2. We've been working very closely with the Department of Transportation and the Bureau of Engineering regarding uh, these street closures that are required for the launch box area to launch the TBMs. We started the process with city staff over two years ago, so there are no surprises, and what, what will be presented to you in the future uh, will be a well-coordinated application. Okay. And what are the areas that are currently closed for that project? For Section 2, there are no areas that are currently closed. Okay. There are lane restrictions related to utility construction, but there are no road closures on Section 2. Okay. Any questions for the Purple Line? Um, okay, we appreciate the presentation. You guys are obviously very busy, and it's good to hear that things are going relatively well. Thank you. I do have a public comment. Oh, or come on up, sir. Vice President, uh, board members, Jim Cohen, I'm the project manager for Section 1. Um, slide 16 is just the uh, general layout of my project, three miles, three stations. Uh, item 17 or page 17. Uh, indicates that the Purple Line Section 1 picks up the existing Purple Line at Wilshire Western and then heads to the west. It's three subway stations, uh, one at La Brea, Fairfax, and La Cienega. We also have some modifications to an existing uh, Red Line and Purple Line yard. Um, the budget, FFGA budget is uh, $2.82 billion. Uh, and the forecast right now is $3.09 billion. Uh, revenue date, as far as the FFGA, we have October 31st, 24, but our planned uh, revenue service date is November 8th, 2023. Next slide gives you uh, an example of what's going on at uh, Wilshire Western, where we have our retrieval shaft. Wilshire Western is where the new subway line is going to tie into the existing subway line. The current activities, as mentioned here, we have SOE, supportive excavation piles, are being installed and also potholing to determine what underground utilities are there. Uh, we've installed approximately 67 uh, piles. Uh, we have 67 to install. Uh, we've, uh, done, we've installed uh, some of those to date. Uh, the pile installation started in December and we hope to finish the end of this month. Uh, again, potholing activities are continuing. The next activity after the piles will be installed is uh, jet grouting and decking. The jet grouting activity densifies the soil, uh, firms it up so we can have uh, our tunneling come in there without any surface uh, settlement. What does the uh, FFGA stand for? Full funding grant agreement. That's the agreement, as Mike mentioned, with the, our federal partners. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, the next slide, uh, 19, gives an, uh, an update of what's happening at La Brea. Uh, right now, uh, we have fine grading. We're installing the grounding grid and mud mat 
and uh, dewatering. La Brea is our first station. It's the furthest along. We've actually gone all the way down to the bottom, and now we're starting to work our way up uh, and building the actual station structure itself. Uh, as noted here, the excavation was completed in November of 2017. We started the mud slab, uh, <coughs> excuse me, late, late November, and the dewatering activities continue to keep that uh, box dry. We plan on uh, beginning our actual structural concrete, which is the structural slab on the bottom, uh, this month. And the photograph, uh, the upper photograph just shows you the bottom of the excavation and the mud mat, which is just a thin layer of concrete to keep the area kind of clean so we're not walking on the native soil that's uh, under there. And the bottom photograph is some uh, vacuum wells that we use to dewater the site. Slide uh, 20 is just giving you uh, an idea of the schedule at La Brea Station. Um, obviously, we've uh, um, completed a bunch of the pre-work, and now the major effort at La Brea is physically building that concrete structure. Next slide is, uh, gives you an update at Fairfax. At Fairfax, uh, we're doing excavation under the deck, and we're putting whalers and struts, which allows us to safely excavate lower uh, to the bottom of the uh, excavation. Um, we're beneath, we're uh, underneath the concrete decking. Uh, Wilshire, um, and, uh, Wilshire and Fairfax, is uh, all our decking is complete. The public is riding on our temporary uh, surface up there. Uh, and uh, we're, again, uh, working on the excavation. Um, the upper photograph shows the uh, level B whalers. There's four or five different levels of uh, support that has to go down in order to keep that box safely supported. So that shows you a, a B level, which is the second level down. And the lower photograph just shows us uh, an example of the equipment that's used to excavate that soil uh, in, in about 15 foot layers uh, in order to bring us down to the bottom of the excavation. Slide 22 indicates, again, uh, the schedule at the Fairfax. As I mentioned, uh, uh, Fairfax is a little behind La Brea because we started the sequence with La Brea, Fairfax, and La Cienega. Um, and that concludes uh, my first portion of my presentation. And um, I'll gladly take any questions you have um, on this part before I enter into the uh, issue on our um, uh, noise uh, concerns at uh, Wilshire and Western. Is there any questions? Mr. Davis? Yes, um, I want to say that I think in terms of the Purple Line Section 1 is such a critically important uh, showcase for this project in terms of the numerous people that come through the area, the businesses, the many of them that are impacted. And uh, you uh, have done significant work in Wilshire La Brea area in terms of goals and deadlines of completion, what do we have any uh, idea about how long it would take us to finish um, the station, for example, at La Brea uh, and also at Fairfax? Or is there a universal kind of schedule of well, estimated I, times of completion? Okay. I, I think if you um, look at uh, slide uh, 20, it, it gives you some uh, the, the schedule of uh, La Brea. And uh, sorry, we don't have numbers. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It, the uh, sec, uh, La Brea, uh, Wilshire La Brea station schedule. So that kind of breaks up that whole construction oh, into major right. activities. Okay. So, so right yes. now, uh, we're starting on the one, two, three, four, the fifth line down where it says station structures, MEP, that stands for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, and finishes. So that we've just started. Uh, uh, that large bar. So that gives you an idea of the work that's going to happen under the deck mm -hmm. and when that station is actually completed, mm -hmm. then we will remove the decking that everyone is using now and then restore the street. So um, that, that this will give you an idea of the duration of, uh, right now we, we say we're in a steady state sure. there because we're really not impacting the public too much. All our work is underground and accessed through our, sh our uh, staging areas on La Brea, both north and south. And uh, we, ha we have also, I believe,
leave. You also have a, a schedule on Fairfax, very similar to that, which is pushed out just a bit because like I mentioned, uh, Fairfax Station is our second in, in the sequence. Great, I know you're gonna report on um, noise soon, but in terms of the activity of businesses around the uh, fund, uh, have we had any activity around that in this particular area in Section 1 from small businesses that have said that they were impacted or adversely impacted? And that uh, needed a yes, we have um, businesses that have signed up for the BIF, the Business in in Interruption Fund. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the details and the amounts here, um, but there was a, an extensive outreach by our BIF program to, uh, to go out to all the uh, small mom and pop um, operations all along the alignment at all of three, three stations. And I, there have been a, a bunch that have been uh, signed up, and, uh, but I'll have to get back to you as far as the numbers and the dollar value. Thank you. I'd like to uh, address some of the questions on the BIF fund. In the future when we come here, we'll include a summary slide of the BIF on each project like we did on regional Okay. Next All right. Um, well, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the board to have us and our contractor. We have contractor representatives here at this meeting. Um, I'm just going to make some opening remarks, and then if there's some technical questions, we have staff here that may be able to answer better than I can. Um, Metro strives to be good neighbors uh, while performing the required construction activities in the street and our staging yards. Uh, we've successfully completed work of a similar nature, but vastly more extensive at La Brea, Fairfax, and La Cienega with minimal complaints from residents about noise and from the general public re uh, related to traffic issues. Uh, Metro and STS, our contractor, have taken the lessons learned on uh, mitigating the few complaints uh, from the other three construction sites and have implemented those at Wilshire Western. So Wilshire Western is the sort of, the, it's not a station, it's our fourth major uh, work area and we've taken the lessons learned from those three other stations that I've just reviewed with you and have implemented uh, the best practices for noise mitigation at Wilshire Western. There's a, the, there is a defined scope of work that needs to be com accomplished at Wilshire Western and Metro and the various city departments are doing the best we can to balance the often competing needs of maintaining traffic, minimizing impacts to adjacent businesses, and minimizing the noise impacts to the residents, especially at, light, at night. So there's three groups often at uh, competing interests of, uh, of uh, when we should be doing the work that's uh, required uh, to complete our, our retrieval shaft. Uh, Metro and STS, our contractor, have site, have staff on site monitoring the construction with specific instructions to be especially attuned to activities that are occurring at night and to instruct the field crews to modify their operations if a more quiet method can be employed or if additional targeted noise mitigation and equipment or materials can be installed. Metro and STS work in real time to act on any complaints received on the official Metro hotline that's staffed 24 hours a day. So our construction relations staff has given out, I don't know how many thousands of cards that has a, the construction hotline. So if there's any issues on the purple line, whether it be noise or dust or anything, that, that hotline is manned uh, 24 hours a day. And we strive to get back uh, within a few hours it's my understanding that we've been compliant with our noise variance the vast majority of time while at Wilshire Western. And any time we're out of compliance, actions are quickly taken to bring us back into compliance. Um, before I turn this over to uh, other Metro staff if needed, um, to more fully describe to you the actions of we're taking to be good neighbors. I'd like to bring to your attention a plan to minimize the duration of the needed construction at Wilshire Western that will soon be formally brought uh, to the board for your official approval. Uh, Metro, STS, and Council District 10 
are going to be requesting a 10-day continuous closure of Wilshire Boulevard from February 16th to February 25th in order to compress the time and impacts uh, required uh, uh, for this work uh, and minimize the impacts to the residents and the motoring uh, public. Um, I'd like to bring to your attention that the president's holiday occurs within this 10-day uh, period, continuous closure, and that's one of the reasons why we're asking for this 10-day is because it's really just four days of, uh, of actually work uh, uh, during the 10 days. Um, while uh, during this two-week period, the construction activities will be more intense, we're going to be cramming a lot of work into a two-week period as, a, as opposed to having multiple weekend uh, and night work. Um, the duration of the overall construction impacts and the impacts themselves should be lessened. Um, so that's my sort of opening remarks. We have staff here from Construction Relation, both Metro and uh, STS, and uh, I'd be willing to uh, respond, and if I can't, I'll ask the staff to respond to any questions you may have. I have a question about the Paleo Zone. Yes. That sounds like a diet. <laughs> well, okay. The, the paleo the, the paleo zone is uh, is at Fairfax Station. It's um, identified uh, um, a certain layer of strata soil that may uh, contain uh, these artifacts. And our agreement uh, with the Page Museum uh, is that we Metro have hired paleontologists to be working in that uh, Fairfax excavation alongside with our contractors and we excavate in six inch lifts. And uh, the paleontologists are there looking for any uh, indication of uh, any uh, artifacts that uh, need to be, need to be, yes, uh, fossils uh, to, to be preserved. Um, as of this date, um, most of our finds have been at La Brea, um, where we really didn't think we would be finding these. That, that's the, the mammoth skull and the tusk that, uh, sure if you've seen on, on various news organizations, those have been found out at La Brea. We found uh, uh, very few fossils to date at, at uh, Fairfax, and we're almost out of that, um, that layer, that strata that would be uh, containing those. Very, very interesting. Uh, Commissioner Sinto? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the report. A um, couple of things. One is, did we receive any, any complaints regarding the um, previous report that we had since October, or I'll wait for that maybe. Uh, but I do want to ask the 10 day closure, continuous closure on Wilshire, that's yes. obviously a big issue. Um, <coughs> have we already gotten the traffic management control plans, the DOT, and, yes. and work yeah. together? Yes, all that, uh, and, and Jill Steiner with STS can give it, but uh, we're working with uh, DOT, uh, we're working with uh, BOE, we worked with the council district, uh, we also um, have uh, vetted this through the FTA to make sure it's uh, compliant with our FEIR and also FEIR is final environmental impact report. Thank you. We, so just, we like to make a record because it's public. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so we vetted that through uh, the FTA um, and our county council has uh, also weighed in on that the 10 day uh, closure uh, does not uh, counter ban any, any of our environmental concerns. But we are uh, well in the process of uh, getting traffic management approved, and we already have council district approval. Thank you. Commissioner Davis. I wanted to ask in terms of noise, is there a general standard operating hour that we uh, adhere to? Is it 9 to 5, or in terms of the construction that we do around that area? Yeah, we have, there. there's a, uh, uh, what we have is a nighttime noise variance. So there's uh, during the daytime, and I don't have the exact hours. During I the, just want to know just the framework. I mean, it doesn't have to be specific. Right, but just Brian generally. Hancock. Yeah, sorry, Brian Hancock with Metro Third Party. Hey, uh, you're allowed to work 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. without a nighttime noise variance from the Los Angeles Police Department. Okay. We do have some variances in place. We've also got applications in from the police department to get more variances. As we need it per project, obviously. Right, and and the daytime uh, 
noise limits are based on the, uh, is there a limit during the day as far as the, the decibel level? Or, uh, it, or is this the ambience? Sure. I would suspect that most of the complaints are coming from the nighttime variant right. that we are granted. Is that what it is? Yes, they're okay. coming at night, but and, and we've got they're, this they're backup to show that we're not exceeding our tolerances that we put into the EIR and all these environmental boxes. So we can supply that to you if you need it. That's we are. I, I understand that if we're going to have a great transportation system, it can't take place without noise. But of course, I don't live at the construction site either. But I do understand and I know that we're working hard and we will resolve it. I just wanted a better uh, awareness of what the hours were and how it worked in terms of when we apply, particularly for the evening hours. So, right. so again, we have a, an approved nighttime noise variance that allows us to uh, go up to a certain decibel level and, and, and uh, the, the complaints at this area have been very few. Um, and again, we are implementing best practices and lessons learned from our other three constructions. And we, we strive to be good neighbors, um, our contractor and, and us. We, we want to get this work completed as soon as possible with the least amount of impact, especially to those people at night. But unfortunately, there needs to be a certain scope of work done. And we can't do everything during the day and close the street for a long period of time. So again, it's a balancing act. Try to do our best. Thank you. Um, I don't have any further questions. I do appreciate the pres presentation, um, and I thought it might be useful next time you guys come in uh, to see us. Um, if you could bring someone from your, uh, I know you Metro is doing uh, really interesting work around um, small business inclusion in your contracting, and I think it would be. I think it would be valuable for our board to kind of hear hear what you're doing. Uh, we're always looking for ways to uh, to promote inclusion here at Public Works. Yes, sir. Hi. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I'll ask uh, Miguel Cabral, who heads up that group, to come. Uh, and um, you know, I think Commissioner Jacinto, you met him before, so we'll we'll definitely include that. Perfect. Thank we're you. Proud of Thank you all very much. Happy New Year and. Uh, Stay healthy. Dr. Williams, you have a card on this agenda item. Is interested in the other projects not mentioned today. However, I was a member of the PDCD construction management for the LA Red Line Phase 1 downtown six years so I know something about construction management and impacts however you have right now a metro proposal to do traffic supply and demand management alternative for the SR 710 North Extension corridor it was not mentioned any time today oh it's not a big project anymore, but it's worth, under Measure R, $700 million. 30% of the corridor lies within Los Angeles City. South Pasadena, Alhambra, Pasadena, and even La Cañada, Flint Ridge, and Rosemead are trying to get pieces of that without any real commitment and without any cooperation or integration with LA City. 30% of, eh, let's say $700 million. Hey, over the next 10 years, that's not a bad number to look for, but they don't even present it to you. So I'm somewhat concerned about the adequacy of this entire presentation Although I would like to get a digital copy of all of the slides and such, that would be nice. Uh, because it's also part of the Sierra Club Transportation Committee meeting last night, where what are we going to do during 2018? And I've only Two been minutes. on it for 30 years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Dr. Campos, have I cleared the desk? Yes, you have. Thank you. We will adjourn uh, today's meeting. Um, of the Board of Public Works and wish everyone a 
uh, productive weekend. Thank you.